Great. Thanks so much, Jack. And thanks, uh, Artie, and thanks for those, uh, all the smart people at the back for Room Now for making this a success. Thanks for people hanging out till the end, and obviously for the great online crowd. So um, obviously I'm going to burn my time with a little anecdote. So you know how when you're nervous about giving a talk, because I'm back on the saddle again. So there's two kind of anxiety dreams I had. The first one was that I was in my pajamas, but from here down. <laughs> the second one was, you know, you ride a bike, you sometimes forget. It's like, do I remember how to talk standing up? So you'll see, you'll be the ones to judge it. And although Hamilton's near and dear to where I live, I'm actually London, but it's all sort of the same suburbia kind of, of uh, Toronto, the way Fort Worth and Dallas and Farm or something or another are all the same here. Until you live there, then you say it's not. So these are my disclosures. So um, you're going to do a lot of voting on this, and there are no right or wrong answers. It'll be opinion-based, which is always... Um, easy to see if we can get consensus or not. So I want to talk about if you practice cycling or switching in RA and does it align with best practice to understand why guidelines in RA suggest either option may be appropriate from within a class or going without a class. Consider potential differences of durability of response in those who cycle within a class versus switching to another class and really have knowledge of data showing the strategy differences to incorporate into your practice. So the ACR guidelines really say treat to a target. Start with methotrexate in rheumatoid arthritis patients, especially poor prognosis. And then if that is unsuccessful, you don't achieve the target, start a biodemart or a JAK inhibitor. If that doesn't work out, switch to another advanced therapy if the target isn't met. So most targets not being met would be secondary loss of benefit or not meeting a deep sustained remission. And then basically don't discontinue the drug that works. Keep the drugs going, but if you need to lower a dose or stop the drug that didn't work, which is diametrically opposed to ULAR, that says if a patient's in remission, keep it going or consider lowering the dose of the more expensive agent, so to speak. So ULAR guidelines as well say the same thing, is once you start with uh, methotrexate and often it's in combination with glucocorticoids or sometimes double or triple therapy, if you read the fine print of the ULAR guidelines, which are going to be revised and represented at ULAR this year. But basically, they say in the phase two, if you're methotrexate inadequate responder, you don't meet targets, secondary loss of benefit, don't tolerate it, et cetera, then add a biodemart or a JAK, and then continue to treat to a target and do the same thing again. So there is no preference of what should be first line advanced therapy, and then should you go within class or outside of class. So the first case, uh, and these are based loosely on true patients, but the hand x-rays are certainly my patients, or the hand uh, pictures. 34-year-old woman, active RA for 10 years, so she's 24, double positive, and she's now postpartum. And she was on uh, TNF during the whole pregnancy. She doesn't want to have any more kids, as after each one she's flared, so she's had three pregnancies, this is the third kid. And at first she was on triple therapy, because that's what we do in Canada. And she stopped breastfeeding. RA didn't settle with glucocorticoids, so she stayed on her TNF, sertralizumab pegol, the whole pregnancy. Um, because she's done breastfeeding and she's flaring, methotrexate was added back in, still not responding. She's tired with the new baby, her two other kids, um, and because of the act of RA, and her mood is pretty low. So I'll let you uh, poll at any time and do the answers. So. Which drug would you choose in this patient with an inadequate response to TNF? Another TNF, she has done her kids, so she says. IL-6 inhibitor, abatacep, rituximab, JAK inhibitor, leflunamide, or you'd pick any of them except for leflunamide. So we're going to let a few more people vote, both here and uh, our people listening, and we'll see if we get some degree of answers, and the, the votes are going up. So really, there's nothing wrong in any of these uh, answers. Uh, there's some I would do more than others. Um, and we'll get here and see. We've got some votes still casting. So we'll see where we're at here on this and kind of look. Um, interesting. So it's almost like um, a dose response in the order I gave, which is very interesting. Um, 
Yep. So at least one in three right now are saying, oh, I'd go to another TNF. She did well. Um, Leflunamide, people aren't loving. People might go to Abitacept. Only one in six is going to a Jack. And IL-6 um, got voted low. And Rituximab's sort of um, it's starting the race now, a couple of things. So it just shows we don't have a clue what to do. And, I, and even what I would do in one day might be different in another. And I'm honest with patients that at this point in time, as uh, Professor Choi said, we, we, we need personalized medicine. We don't know who will respond to what. So pretty good voting here uh, and uh, no real consensus. Um, so I did discuss treatment options. And by the way, she could have chosen anything. And by the way, with personalized medicine, I often um, talk people into their decisions saying, well, you could choose this or that. I usually don't give five decisions or they don't choose. It's information overload. Um, so she is going to uh, avoid pregnancy. Uh, she said her husband was going to uh, have surgery uh, to avoid pregnancy in the future for her. So um, if she was thinking of uh, more kids, another TNF would probably make sense. I talked about rituximab. She's double seropositive, and if you were astute, you saw the MCPs were not only swollen, but some degree of subluxation on the dominant hand. And uh, we talked about a lot of things. So. Um, Here's what we could do. So this is TNF to TNF, obviously not in this patient, but um, these are mostly primary non-responders because they didn't meet a primary endpoint at 12 weeks of an ACR 20. So an ACR 20 is usually 50% improvement on joints or more. So the joints might be improving in this study or not. But I'm showing it because either TNF could be fine, but once you switch to the next TNF, look at that ACR 20. That ACR 20 is only about 20 some percent when you switch. And the ACR 70, um, don't ever tell a funder, but it's, uh, it's closer to zero. But again, most TNF patients are secondary loss of effect on um, why they switch. But that sort of sobered me on um, why I would go to TNF to TNF or why I wouldn't. Okay, next question. So when would you prefer switching from a TNF inhibitor to another TNF? Because one third of you said you're doing that. So consideration of pregnancy in the near future side effect from the first TNF, but excellent response. If that is all I can get access to, all the above, or both one and three. So um, I'll just go back for a second, let that poll go for a second. Um, okay, so you're casting votes fairly quickly. So some of you are saying, well, it's all of the above or any of the above because I already chose a TNF to TNF. So we'll see in a second uh, where you're at and uh, if this is gonna change a bit. Okay, interestingly, so um, a lot of all of the above, eight out of 10 at least, and one out of six is saying side effect from the first but excellent clinical response. And there's no right or wrong answers here. It's what you think and what you'll do. Okay, so when would you consider switching to a different mechanism of action in RA after a TNF failure? Most failures are secondary loss of effect. Some are lack of tolerance, some are primary non-responders, but most are, they did well and then over time lost benefit. So when would you consider switching a primary TNF non-responder Patient is using monotherapy, so I'm going to switch out of TNF to TNF. Almost always I would switch to something else, TNF then something else, all of the above, or one and two. So we'll see, because again, um, uh, I think that if I asked this in Canada, we'd get slightly different answers than what we're going to get here, none of which are wrong or right. They're, they're all potentially uh, good answers. So primary non-responder, uh, one and three are saying, get out of there, or all of the above. All these reasons I'd move on. So in other words, I usually go TNF to another mechanism. Um, okay, so a lot of people are saying there's reasons like monotherapy, uh, primary non-responder would be some of the reasons. And again, it's all about access and experience, and there's a lot of data supporting whatever you do, and the guidelines support it. So this is a nice uh, investigator-led RCT out of France, and I think it didn't get as much play as it should have when it was published. It came into JAMA back in 2016. So the question was, your patient has RA, they're on a TNF inhibitor, and now you're going to do something else. So most are secondary loss of response, not intolerability, not primary non-response, although a few percent would be either of those. And 300 patients, and they were randomized to TNF to TNF, 
or TNF to other MOA. And the other MOAs were what you would have thought of back then. Tocilizumab, half of the ones that were randomized to other MOA did that. A third did rituximab, a third did abatacept, or a quarter for the other ones. The other ones went from one TNF to another, and you could choose what you wanted. You could go to tanercept to adalimumab, adalimumab to infleximab, whatever, sertralizumab to a tanercept. You could just do what you wanted, but the data are super important. Look at week 12, cycling within a TNF. You get about the same moderate response, but you get less good response. That's your green chunk at the top. And this is the same idea at week 12, 24, and 48. So you can get um, a response on whatever you do on average for patients, but if you want more people getting that good response, which I think we do, treating to a target, then you should go out of class. And I'll tell you, back in 2015, when it was first presented and then published um, thereafter, that did change my practice, where I was sort of TNF and just move on to something else. There's another reason as well. So efficacy, but durability of response that we'll talk about later. This is a systematic review. These aren't RCTs, though. A lot are just um, uh, registries. Um, so what they're saying is that drug retention favors going TNF to something else more than TNF to TNF for any of the reasons. Stopping because of safety or stopping because of inefficacy, again, most are secondary lack of response. So it's always favoring in these sorts of studies, get out of the class. Well, you would say, well, then why do the guidelines not support it? And it's because we don't know what to do and whom, and we can still get a good response no matter what we do in most of the patients. Okay, so... Um, which drug or class of drugs you choose if you're not, um, if not in um, a, a low response after TNF IR? My clinical pearl is almost anything we try next will have a blunted response. So sometimes we're a bit marketed to saying that's not the case, but in general, um, deep remission, ACR 70s, even DOS, low disease state in general is a bit better um, if you were not TNF exposed. Um, in RA, once you're a TNF non-responder, it's a blunted response. And this is one of many slides that kind of give you the idea that your ACR uh, 2050-70 and the Keystone rule go down about 10% post uh, TNF. So bit of a blunted response. And you could say, oh, aha, I know some data that aren't like that. I'm just giving you average data here. We also know, and, and Jack wasn't chosen very high, and Abitacept was chosen a little bit higher. We also know that after TNF or BioDMARD inadequate response, head to head, 300 per group, you're seeing in rheumatoid arthritis, Abitacept was inferior to upadacitinib. So if you look at a DOS of less than 2.6, which isn't remission, but it's a pretty low disease state, you can see, interestingly, in these hard to treat patients, half on UPA, 15 milligrams a day, achieve that response by uh, 24 weeks. And although Abitacept does very well, it's uh, one in three, so a third. Okay, if we look at a CDI, which is a really tight one, a uh, CDI of less than or equal to 2.8 would be one swollen, one tender, MD global of a half out of 10, like a half of a point, or, or, um, and patient global zero. That's how you would get that result, very tight. And again, you can see about one in five on UPA, 21%, and about one in six on Abitacept. And some of you might not have chosen it because of access, and some of you would have said, yes, but I'm worried about safety because the serious adverse events, not a primary outcome, were numerically a little bit higher on UPA than Abitacept. But again, I'm hopefully treating in that benefit of I want benefit, I want safety, I want access, and you have to weigh all that on each patient. The other thing is, this is old now, but this is from 2017, looking at a big population database, RA patients, and they're looking at persistence. If you keep changing your drugs, they cost the system more, because every time you change, you might not respond to the next one. So this is after TNF, and they're looking here, you have better pers persistence in every single database, including this large one, if you go out of class. And so that's the black, the dotted black is staying within class. And the big difference here is that you get persistence in half the patients, 48%, if they're on 
going from TNF to a different class than if uh, you get it 40% persistence while you're following over uh, you know, a few years, two years there, but longer, you get only about 40% persistence TNF to TNF. And it's cost efficient, so they said. And this was published before Biosimilars, because it's a US database, uh, so before they were widely used, or still not widely used in most areas in the US. So still cost efficient, they said, or more cost effective going out of class. Okay, let's do another case. 50-year-old woman, and again, these aren't her hands, but you can see how horrible this patient is. So it's a myth that we don't have damage in our patients, and it's not our Canadian healthcare system. It's just some people do damage. So 50-year-old woman, seropositive RA, eight years. She flared after four years of sustained remission on triple, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine. So the first thing we do when someone flares is, is it a blip or is it a sustained state? So she got IM or intramuscular glucocorticoids or both, or maybe if it's telemedicine, a short course of oral glucocorticoids. So she starts tofacitinib, five milligrams twice a day, Fun fact, in Ontario, where I'm from, tofacitinib, we get the same access, same cost to the system as a biosimilar TNF. So we use lots of tofa. We got it approved almost the same time as you did in the U.S., but we get it at, uh, I'll call it a discounted price. Anyway, she was on tofacitinib, five milligrams twice a day with methotrexate, and she had a rapid, deep response. So all is happy four years into her disease. However... After two years of TOFA plus methotrexate, she's flaring. Again, we say, are you flaring uh, or is it a new state? So we tried glucocorticoids. We asked about adherence. We can check the pharmacy records on um, electronic health records. And presumably, she was taking her drugs because she was filling them. Okay, so she's gone triple, now she's gone methotrexate plus TOFA. So if an RA patient has secondary loss of effect from a jack, would you use, you can vote at any time, use another jack, switch to a bio DMARD. So this is the other way around of what I told you on the first case. <clears throat> Either depends on the reason why you're switching in past treatment, or I have no idea. So we'll see how many people are actually honest, because... I don't know what to do, but that doesn't stop me ever from prescribing. I just tell them, you know, we got lots of options. What do you want to do? Here's what I think you should do kind of thing. Okay, so we're getting good votes coming in. So we shall see. Um, okay, so you're doing exactly what I kind of told you to consider doing going out of class. So at least almost 40% of you are saying, well, I'd switch to BioDMARD. She's uh, uh, TNF and other BioDMARD naive. Um, one in four or five is saying, I'll use one in four. I'll use a jack. Do either. Uh, depends on the reason why you're switching and past treatment. It always depends on past treatment and it always depends on access. And 3% of you are totally honest. So there you go. And now we're kind of evening it up a little bit. Um, so uh, although I just told you what could be done in the first case, I'll tell you what we did do, but sometimes it's for various reasons. Uh, so she says, you know, I liked an oral med. I did really well on TOFA. It really helped my pain. Um, I'd like to try another oral. So the first thing I said is there are no randomized controlled trials. I have no clue if this is the right option, but I have it in the cupboard so we can get it pretty quickly. And we do have it. Uh, we have samples of pretty much everything that's um, on patent. And basically I said... Um, if it doesn't work quite quickly in the next two to three months, then obviously we'll move on. So interestingly, and this is my experience, I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but she had, she was better quickly, and by three months she was back in remission. By two months she said she was, but I um, observed her joint count at three months. So just anecdotally, because that's all it is right now is anecdotal. So I don't see excellent results in all patients switching jack to jack, but the patients who have cycled through everything or who can't um, do uh, an injection or refuse to or don't want to, I've seen okay results. I don't know about retention, and I think it begs an RCT. So I don't know the right thing to do in a case like that. So what we do know, I'm just going to give you some data. So this is our site plus a large site in Toronto. We looked at retention of JAKs, um, and they were longer than BioDMARDs, whether you adjust for line of therapy, adjust for disease duration, age, sex, gender, the amount of uh, drugs you've tried before. And it was um, better. It was um, obviously first-line therapy has better retention than second or third. But you can see that the differences are starting to split after 12 months. 
This is true on many registries, but not all. So there's um, a Canadian one of um, Ruma Data, which is Quebec, combining data with the OBRI Ontario, not showing this, showing equal retention, but they did not adjust for line of therapy. And again, you can see the differences here. That is not answering your question as well. What about the jack-to-jack -jack retention? So we're working on that. I have students working on that, but we don't have the data yet. The other thing we know is that in the jackpot trial, there is cycling jack to jack. That's sometimes because it's the only option left. You've tried all sorts of um, maybe one from every class, and now you're recycling drugs again, so you're going jack to jack. So um, the reasons for uh, stopping are often ineffectiveness, secondary loss of response as usual. Sometimes it's lack of tolerability or SAEs. And the reason for stopping the second when you're going jack to jack seemed to be lack of effect, um, not very often, but AEs a bit more often. Jack to biodemard, you can see on the far part there that the reason for um, going jack to biodemard, you're switching because of ineffectiveness or for AEs almost on equal amounts. So we don't know yet, and as I say, we need an RCT. However, in Australia, 40% of RA prescriptions on their big OPAL database, which is almost all the rheumatologists in Australia, 40% of their JAK scripts are JAK to JAK. So if you want to know answers over time, Australia should be doing a pragmatic trial. Um, so yeah, weird. So not every patient's getting a JAK. So about 30% of their scripts are a JAK in RA, but 40% of that 30% are jack to jack. So we will know more, but we need an RCT. Okay, next patient, we have a 41-year-old guy, sear negative erosive RA, nine years ago, wrist fusion deformities. He's got NASH um, fibrosis, F3, where methotrexate should only be used with caution or not at all. He's got swollen and tender joints, five and eight, and pretty active disease, uh, CRP is up, and you can see his damage. So he'd been on triple in the past, obviously methotrexate had to be stopped, and then he was lost to follow up and came in with damage on no drugs, as some of these people sometimes do. Um, so he's been flaring. So this guy has F3 fibrosis, so he's going to be a monotherapy guy or at least probably not methotrexate use. So what would you do with this guy? He was on tocilizumab when this occurred on monotherapy. Would you give this guy a different IL-6? You can vote at any time. Use a TNF, uh, likely a TANRSAP, better in monotherapy maybe than the monoclonals, maybe. JAK inhibitor, rituximab, abatacept, or I'd do anything other than give a TNF because it's a monotherapy uh, case. And again, all these answers are potentially right, except for I probably wouldn't use rituximab because he is double negative. Uh, despite having damage. Um, again, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. 11% are saying, well, maybe rituximab, but he is double negative. Um, doesn't mean you get a good, don't get a good response. It just means your high bar response might be blunted. Okay, so TNF makes sense. Um, any of the above except for TNF makes sense. So again, you can see our practice patterns. There is no right answer. We could do any of these things potentially. So one in three patients with a biologic are on monotherapy, and you do get a blunted response of an ACR 50 or 70 in the systematic review of RCTs if you're on a monotherapy TNF. So in other words, if I'm on background methotrexate comparing those trials, placebo uh, subtracted versus uh, monotherapy, monotherapy um, instead of combination therapy on a TNF, you have an odds ratio of about seven or eight of getting an ACR 50 on combo instead of on mono. So that's why some of you didn't choose that. Um, so I think the durability of JAX might be a little bit better. There, um, the product monographs on rituximab and abatacept say in conjunction with uh, methotrexate, which doesn't seem to stop people from using them as monotherapy. Retention seems to be the same on rituximab monotherapy as combo with methotrexate in long-term extension, real-world databases. And abatacept, the retention seems to be about the same, but the high bar outcomes might be a little bit less. So um, we can look here at uh, durability of response. And again, you, yeah, monotherapy has less durability on the, the purple thing at the bottom if you're on a TNF from that large jackpot study. 
So um, this is a safety question, and I, the clock's ticking down. So maybe I'll just, uh, I'm going to skip the poll, and I'm going to just tell you. This guy, you can see the hand deformities. And we want to know, I'm just going to skip here and look at the safety, because some of you did not choose a jack at the beginning. So FDA has these warnings for you, and I think you've all seen them. And the jack uh, um, response from our American College of Rheumatology says it is important to be able to treat our patients to have this discussion with them. And I think at this, this is a good place to stop because you're probably going to have questions about it at the Q&A. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. We have time for a few questions before our next speaker. Janet, what do you think of the black box warning for the jack inhibitors and how it changes some of the switch uh, decisions you've talked about? Right, so I think we're seeing that if I would have asked uh, this question maybe uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we might get different um, answers on safety and benefit and usage. So um, I think, first of all, uh, the good thing is rheumatologists don't get sued. Even in U.S., you don't get sued relative to eMERGE physicians and ob and stuff like that. But at the center of all this is really a true discussion. We want to do no harm as physicians and a true discussion between benefit and risk. So do I think that first patient who is like 30-some that uh, had no cardiovascular risk factors that I would even discuss this? I wouldn't discuss it, but I'm lucky because Health Canada just said in high-risk patients discuss the benefit and risk. That's our only label change on one drug, not all JAKs. So that's our only label change right now is discuss the data where appropriate. So I think um, we have to look at number needed to treat to help people, number needed to harm, and what else comes into it, patient preference, their comorbidities, uh, durability of response, and frankly, access. If all costs are equal, you're probably going to do what you're most comfortable with and forego the uh, dialogue. So what I think isn't necessarily what FDA thinks, and I think you have to make your own decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a, a question about whether you prefer one jack over the other or, or and what, what goes into your decision making there. Right. So interestingly, so you guys got your first jack in 2013 and we got it in 2014. So where I am in Ontario, we get preferential access post uh, CSD Mart IR between biosimilar TNFs, because they're the biosimilars. We rituximabs later because it's not approved post CSD Mart, it's only in special cases. So we get biosimilar TNFs, or we get the first jack that came out, which is tofacidinib, probably because the patent clock is ticking most on that one. Um, if, like, first of all, whatever jack you want to use, use. I think we all think in North America that baricidinib in a tough to treat patient is underdosed at two milligrams. Doesn't mean it won't work, but as soon as you're going to four milligrams, you're 100% off label and you're doing BOGO. Buy one, get one out of the cupboard, which isn't sustainable for most patients. So, with that in mind, um, I would use any jack. What am I trending towards now? Uh, UPA, because of the hint of possibly, possibly hint of uh, more remission because of the fact that I don't feel I don't have to talk as much about safety issues on UPA, but do I use tons of each jack? Uh, yes, I do. So whatever you want to use, use. We're not going to use Philgo because we won't get it. All right. We have many questions we'll leave for the uh, Q&A at the end. Thank you very much. Great. Thank Jeff. you.